as we continue our study with reference to the great spiritual needs of the church. <clears throat> now, last, uh, last Sunday we looked at the first part of Ephesians chapter 5 and we spent uh, the entire session on verses 1 through 2. And um, uh, now then when you come to verse 3 down through verse 21, you have some specifics that are mentioned with reference to this wonderful walk. And I want you to follow along because in verse 8, you will notice in the last part of the verse, it says, Walk as children of light. And then in verse 15, See that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now then, <clears throat> in both of those occasions, I believe that we have a present imperative. And this simply means that we have not a request, but that we have, as far as uh, a, the truth is concerned, a, a mandatory a requirement. It is a, an order, if you please. Uh, any of you who are acquainted with imperatives, it just means that uh, there is one who's in the place of authority that's given an order to someone else. And this happens to be the case. Now then, I want you to watch a great contrast as I begin to read, because in verses 3 through 14, um, we have a great contrast between two spheres. One is the right and one is the wrong way to walk. And then from verse 15 on down through verse 21, you have also a great series of contrasts, the right and the wrong way to walk. And here's one of the great spiritual needs as far as the church, the body of Christ, is concerned that uh, simply, I believe, gives us a commentary on what it means to walk this wonderful walk that is mentioned in verse 1 and 2. And perhaps I'll go back and just read verse 1 and 2 in connection with this entire section. Be ye therefore followers or imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, or, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved <coughs> are made manifest uh, by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Therefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now perhaps you observed in verses 3 <coughs> through 14, there was a great emphasis as to the right and the wrong way for a believer 
to walk upon the face of this earth. Here's one. Here are some of the great practical spiritual needs of the believers. Then when you come to verse 15 through 21, there's another great contrast of the right and wrong way, but in another entirely sphere of emphasis. Now, <clears throat> I believe that I could give you a key with uh, just a little summary uh, statement as far as this uh, first section is concerned. Now, looking at uh, verse um, 13 and 14, as well as um, verse, four, uh, verse 8. Now, in verse 8, let me read verse 8 first. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now 13 and 14. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he said, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now, <clears throat> I believe that as far as this section is concerned, and he names some specifics, but generally speaking, this section deals with a great contrast of light and darkness. Light and darkness. That's exactly what you have by way of the emphasis of the commentary upon the wonderful walk as imitators or children of God. Now, he is going to set in contrast some very definite things which are mentioned for us here in Ephesians 5 regarding the walk of darkness and the walk of light. Now let's look at some of these specifics and emphasize the area of darkness and emphasize the area of light. And you've got to remember that he is bringing these things to the fore for the emphasis of what a Christian should be doing and what a Christian should not be doing. Now you've got both the negative and you've got the positive. In fact, he starts out with the negative. We are living in a day that many people do not like to hear anything from a negative point of view. They say, oh, that's negative. We don't want to hear anything about that. You shouldn't speak about sin. Or you shouldn't talk about this. You shouldn't talk about that. Well, now, listen. If you get off on that kick, you're outside of the bounds of the Word of God. The Bible teaches us both things which are sin and things which are righteousness. And we've got to keep that balance with reference to the uh, practical walk of Christianity. And we're in this section which deals with the spiritual need of the uh, walk of the church or those in the church. Now, let's just spend a little time and emphasize these things which note for us <coughs> the negative or the things of darkness. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, now notice what it says, let it not be once named, named among you as become a saints, or that which is fitting or right for the saints. Now you see what he says? The moral issues are very important. And he says, as far as saints are concerned, let it not be once named among you as that which is fitting for the believer. And he hits that right off of the bat. That's the first thing. Now then he moves on from the morals to the messages. But foolish, but uh, filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not right or befitting, but rather giving of thanks. In contrast to what our message should be, it should not be that of the smut. It should not be that of the looseness. It should not be that of the, uh, of the gutter. But it should be that which is of praise. Now then, you'd be surprised, but uh, Christianity today has slipped. Slipped real badly, shall we say, with reference to these two areas. And um, uh, I, I think we are to blame for some of it because of a doctrine which we dogmatically hold to. But sometimes you can get off balance, can't you? You can hold dogmatically to one sphere of truth, which 
becomes such a, uh, a great truth for you that you become unbalanced and uh, not realize that there's a danger over there. Now, I am one, and uh, I think most of you are here, that believes in the security of the believer. I believe once when a person is saved, he's saved. And he's saved for all eternity. Now then, when a person holds to that, <coughs> there are some, and particularly we're thinking, with reference to a fellow that possibly you have heard, Bob Thiem, down in Houston, Texas. He's one of these fellows that holds so strong to the area of the grace of God and of the security of the believer that then he makes the rest of life just license. You can do anything you want to do. If you want to swear from the pulpit, go ahead and swear from the pulpit. If you want to come to church in a halter and a bikini, come to church in a halter and a bikini. And this is, this is his whole emphasis. Well, now that is just absolutely contrary to the teaching of Scripture. And it's re the, the reason he ha he's come to that place is because he's so strong upon the security of the believer. And I'm strong too as far as the security of the believer is concerned. But I am not strong to the extent that I hold to license for conduct. Because the Bible does not hold license to conduct either from the standpoint of the morals or from the standpoint of our message. Now then, he goes on and emphasizes some more with reference to the moral issue. And uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit encouraged with this because apparently from the standpoint of the Apostle Paul's day and his ministry as a great missionary, he ran up against this problem constantly. And so there's much given to it in, in light of the morals. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now I want to give you just a little different uh, emphasis here than our English would suggest because there is uh, something to be understood. Let me read verse 5 again and you will notice it in light of its emphasis in just a moment. For this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man now you'll see the little relative pronoun who. That's a personal, uh, he makes it personalized. That's wrong. This is a, uh, a, a neuter relative. And it should uh, be translated this way. Which is idolatry. Now there isn't any antecedent to this relative here. That's in the neuter case. So what you do, you take all three of them because it's the concept, it's the truth. So he is simply saying, one who's a whoremonger, one who's unclean, and one who's covetousness, this is idolatry. This is idolatry. Now, I remember when we were doing this in our Greek class that I had uh, a discussion from one of the students and uh, he says, you know, when, when you stop to think about it, uh, the, ba the business of the morals and the business of the filthy and the business of, <coughs> of being covetousness, uh, that is, can become an idol to you. And anything that holds prominence in the life, that's idolatry. That's idolatry. And here you've got mentioned idolatry. Idolatry in the connection of the morals and idolatry in connection with messages. So, the Apostle Paul says, listen, we're not idol worshipers. And let your conduct be that which is not idolatry. Great need, great spiritual and practical need of the church is to not walk in idolatry from the standpoint of the morals, from the standpoint of our talk, our tongue. Because he goes on to say, this is the type of company, is the type of company that you are exemplifying. Because idolatry has no inheritance. No inheritance in the kingdom of God. You got to thinking about this. I'm told over in Peter 
that each one of us have an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. Isn't that right? We've got an inheritance. Now then, I am told, as far as the Bible is concerned, that we should have a conduct that does not manifest someone that's spiritually bankrupt. And these practical specifics that are mentioned here is nothing more than the Christian's testimony that he's spiritually bankrupt if he's involved in any of this. That's the reason he's mentioned here. You and I must not once be mentioned as this which is fitting for saints. Absolutely not. Because we have such a rich future. We have such a rich inheritance. And the only thing I'm doing is I'm making myself impoverished with reference to my inheritance. Now then, he said, be, be careful. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Empty words. For because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You know, that's quite a company, isn't it? <coughs> For me to keep company with a bracket of society that has no eternal inheritance of blessing and for me to keep company with a bracket of society that's going to be the object of the wrath of God boy that is quite a testimony for me isn't it if I'm to do that he said absolutely no way shape or form be identified because he said be not ye therefore, par therefore partakers with it now this is a very interesting word and I'm going to see if I can explain it. We have two Greek words in the New Testament that means to share. Well, there's more than that probably, but I'm thinking of, the, of these two. Now, this is a, a metoikoi, metokois, and the other is koinonia. Koinonia means to share on a common basis share in common. Now that's the word that is used to translate fellowship over and over and over. And it's also the word that's used to translate, translate it as communion. Now this word is not koinonia. This word is metoikos. And it means partaking with someone in something that he and I were not on common ground. In other words, in this list which is just mentioned, a believer who is born again, he has a new life. He's a new creature in Christ. Now for that believer to share with someone who does not have that same spiritual life but as a lost person and is manifesting all the degradation of the morals and the messages and etc. He said don't be one that will partake with someone that you're literally a foreigner to. Pretty emphatic isn't it? Pretty emphatic. And uh, he, he reminds the Christian. He said, uh, <laughs> you can reach out there and you can get that stuff. And you can take part in that stuff. But actually, you're not on common ground. And here is one of the strong, strong reasons for the prohibition of the mixed marriage. Because for a believer to be joined to an unbeliever, the only common ground is the marriage bond. But they don't have things in common from the standpoint of character. One's a believer, the other's an unbeliever, right? Okay. Now then, let it not be once named among you. 
that you're to be a partaker partaker with someone that you're a foreigner to by virtue of character and by virtue of emphasis he spends um, a little time here doesn't he apparently during his day and I know when you come to 1 Corinthians that here was a real problem because the book of 1 Corinthians is a book that is sent to a group of believers that are involved in a great basket full of problems like the unsaved have. Terrible. But here in this encyclical letter as to be, that was sent into Asia Minor to all of these different churches he said look you're who involved in this business of the emperor worship that we've been under the iron hand of Rome and involving all of these other things from the standpoint of the morals and the standpoint of the speech and uh, all this he said don't be partakers now then he gives us some he gives us a few reasons here and here he's just really emphasizing emphasizing for ye were notice that you were imperfect tense one time in the past this was your linear durative uh, action continuous action for you were sometimes darkness but now in contrast ye are light in the Lord now walk as children of light now what has just been mentioned things of darkness things of the unsaved now he says you're children of light you walk in the light walk as children of the light and it says the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth that's not just the very be best translation it should be for the fruit of the light the fruit of the light that which bears fruit the light the fruit light let's call it that is in goodness is in righteousness and is in truth now that's how you're going to bear fruit of light and you can't be bearing fruit of light if you're out there taking partaking with the fruits of darkness my a great commentary on what it means to be imitators of God as dear children right sure is now he said do something prove what is acceptable unto whom unto the Lord and now have no fellowship here it is koinonia have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them on the one hand I'm told to not even partake of it don't reach over there in that crowd and be a part of that crowd now then he comes along and says don't try to be on common ground with them common ground Is what needs to be done such conduct is not fellowship but rebuke reproving for it is what for it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret or done in them in darkness but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever doth make manifest is light wherefore he saith awake awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light my if there's ever a verse that has just <laughs> a whole basket full of difficulties this is it if you want to just spend a little bit of time wherefore he saith now wake up he says believers 
that are out there in that kind of fellowship. Believers that are doing that kind of thing, they're pictured here as being sleep, spiritual sleep. Now then he goes on to another statement here and rise from the dead. Well, can, can you raise yourself from the dead? No. But this kind of death you can. He's given you a will and a decision, a choice to make, right? So he's saying a Christian that's engaged in this kind of conduct is a Christian that's spiritually asleep and he's spiritually dead. Now he said, if you wake up and you get up, then someone's going to meet you. Christ shall give you light. What a fantastic contrast. This little section of this walk in contrast of light and darkness is a contrast not so mentioned as such but, but is true is a walk of the devil. But when you wake up and get up it says Christ what? Shall give you then it's a walk with a person. All the things of partaking all the things of sharing don't you see? Is with the person of your wonderful Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just marvelous. And as I've spent a great deal of meditation upon this section, I've seen all of these contrasts. Boil it down. Light and darkness. Or death and life. Sleep or awake. Children of the wrath of God are children of the smile of God. That which is wrong or that which is right. That which is in error or that which is in truth. The great spiritual need of the church today as it was in his day is a walk in this time walk in the church age that's vertical. And there are some specifics. And uh, if you have a tendency to look back after putting your hand to the plow, you have a tendency of wanting to look back just remember the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. What all of these things are called. And the exhortation. The imperative is to walk. Walk as children of the light. And I'm glad. We've got an order that's given to us. That can appeal to a provision that God has made for us that we can heed the imperative to walk as children of the light and you can prove you can prove this walk just by virtue of verse 9 goodness righteousness and truth that's the walk of light that's the fruit of light all of these other things that are mentioned are fruits of darkness. Now it doesn't take one very long to be able to get a to be able to go over and get a dictionary and look up some of these words if you have having difficulty as to discovering what some of these things mean. But an adult certainly knows. That when you talk about a moral problem, and when you talk about a filthy message problem, and when you talk about sharing and that kind of stuff, 
and then partaking of that stuff, they know you don't have to spend a great deal of time trying to convict them, convince them. I don't have to convince, I'll reprove in kindness. They already know. So, we're not going to be able to finish this section. We'll do it next time. Let's bow in prayer. Thank you, our Father, for the greatness of your wonderful word. Be pleased, dear Father, to minister its truth. And may we walk with you and love you and serve you as we should in light of the truth of your wonderful book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.